start the recording now. So we've put together this, this is a pilot. Um, it's a pilot in the sense that this is the first time we've done it and we, we intend to run a number of these sessions in the future. So this is called Fact or Fiction and we're discussing COVID vaccinations. This has been disseminated through London Met Lab and um, we are answering your questions. So my name is Dr. Una Fairbrother and who are we? We're a team of London Metropolitan Academics and we felt that in response to the pandemic and those particular anxieties that we have surrounding the safety of vaccinations, how well masks work, social distancing, the nature and behaviour of COVID-19 virus itself, London Met Labs is hosting a series of fact or fiction events where our expert panel will answer your pre-submitted questions and explore with you the topics that most concern you and our community. So this is your opportunity to hear about things that you may have been shouting at the TV about for months to clarify com complex topics and to understand how it relates to you. Um, so this particular session addresses vaccines and in subsequent sessions after Easter, we're going to talk about masks and social distancing and actually the virus itself because there's been so much data talking about sequencing and genomics and variants and stuff, I think it's a whole topic by itself. Just to put it into context, COVID is a very serious disease and we've had 126,000 tragic deaths in the UK and over 2.74 million deaths worldwide um, with 125 million cases. So I'm Una Fairbrother, I'm a reader, Dr. Una Fairbrother, I'm a reader in molecular genomics, head of research and development and the University Ethics Committee. I'm, I've been interested in DNA and RNA since my PhD and I've been teaching biomedical science and biological science for 25 years. Also, this is a picture of me looking resplendent in my plastic apron running our COVID testing centres. Um, we would like and I would like to offer you an unbiased perspective on vaccinations to help you make an informed decision about having the vaccination or recommending it to your loved ones. I've had many, many questions from my friends and family about vaccines. Just to reiterate, COVID is an extremely dangerous virus which can kill in the short term and, as we've seen emerging evidence, produce long term harm. I have been vaccinated myself. I had the Pfizer vaccination. I had a sore arm for two days. My arm was not quite as sore as my husband's arm, which was very sore. And um, I had mild fever in the following week. I'm going to introduce the panel like this. Everybody's done a little um, biography. So the next person is Professor Ken White. So would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, my name is Ken White. I'm a professor of molecular biosciences. I do a lot of teaching in uh, genomics, in particular molecular biology and genetics. So I'm interested in the origin and molecular evolution of the virus and how I can sort of comment on how the virus has emerged and how it changes. I've actually done some research on viruses a long, long time ago. Um, that, that was a leukemic virus I worked on in Japan. So I have some experience in handling viruses. And I have had the Pfizer vaccine and luckily uh, no side effects whatsoever. Thank you very much. Um, Associate Professor Sheila Yaff. Are we running into one of those technical difficulties that I was severely hoping we wouldn't run into? Um, and I can see we don't have Sheila joined us at the moment. So I'm going to introduce her. I know Sheila very well. She's head of student experience and academic outcomes. She is a fully trained biomedical scientist. And in fact, she did her training in the British Army. And her interests include infection control and managing disease transmission. And I hope we are going to be able to get her into the session. Um, she has been vaccinated with first dose of 
uh, the Oxford um, vaccine. And um, she said that she had a tender area around the injection site the following morning, which resolved the next day. And our next panel member is Dr. D. Bacter. Uh, thank you, she, um, thank you, Una. Um, so I'm a senior lecturer in health sciences. I'm a registered nutritionist and also a registered new dietitian who has worked in the NHS. And my interest here is really uh, from a nutrition and health perspective to provide a balanced viewpoint um, because there's lots of questions I get asked as well about diet and supplements and is that sufficiently enough to protect them rather than the vaccine. Um, and I also have been vaccinated just recently on Sunday with the first dose of AstraZeneca and I'm feeling great. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Chris Chandler. Hello, uh, I'm, I'm Chris Chandler. I'm uh, a psychologist and my main interests are in addiction and mental health and I'm interested in, in uh, some of the, the concepts around the uh, impact of the virus and uh, subsequent vaccines on uh, mental health. I have had uh, my first injection of AstraZeneca. I've had no side effects that I know of. Um, and my wife has had uh, both uh, vaccines, uh, doses of the Pfizer vaccine, and she is also without side effects. So uh, we're all good in, in our household at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's one advantage of being over 50, isn't it, that you're eligible <laughs> for, the, for the vaccine. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Prof. Jamil Imal. Thank you, Una. Um, so I'm Jamil Imal. I'm Professor of Immunobiology. Um, I'm interested in infectious disease in general and cancer. Um, for my PhD, I actually worked on vaccine development, not, not against the virus, uh, but so against an important bacterial infection. And then I did my postdoctoral training at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where I worked also on vaccine development, but this time against a human parasitic disease. So about 10 years in total on that. And yes, I had my first uh, Oxford AstraZeneca jab on March the 6th, and I'm looking forward to my second booster jab in 11 weeks time on May the 23rd. Nothing more than a sore shoulder really for a couple of days. Thanks very much. Um, Dr. Samira Jorfi. Hi there, uh, I'm Samira Jorfi. I'm senior lecturer in biosciences. Um, I teach different um, topics, anatomy and physiology, pathology, histology, immunology. Um, my research interests are in viral infection, cancer research, and the effect of microplastics in health and disease. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about the COVID-19 uh, vaccination, um, about the science behind development of this uh, vaccine. So hopefully it can help you with um, making your choice for going for the uh, vaccination. Uh, and um, I've been vaccinated, first dose of um, AstraZeneca, I got it, and only a little bit of sore arm, no more side effects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Anna Baker. Hello everyone. Um, so I'm a senior lecturer in psychology. Um, I'm also a registered health psychologist. So my research has been on chronic disease. So there's a lot of crossover in terms of risk factors and chronic disease, but I also specialize in um, behavior change and the factors associated with that. So that's quite important in terms of COVID protection behaviors and vaccination um, and mental health. Um, in terms of how this relates to what we're doing now, um, behavior change techniques, um, what I'm interested in is the reason why people do or don't change their behavior. So looking at things beyond knowledge and looking at people's belief systems um, and also issues around what influences treatment decision making. Um, I've had the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I said I had no side effects. Um, I had a slight sore arm, but having being somebody who has the flu jab, it didn't hurt as much as the flu jab hurts and I was absolutely fine the next day. Thank you very much. Dr. Stephen Hills.
Hello everybody, uh, my name is Stephen Hills. I'm a senior lecturer in the Guildhall School of Business and Law and I'm also the director of the Health Economics Research Group. Currently conducting some research on social distancing and COVID-19 vaccine uptake. Uh, the first uh, project on social distancing is a project for the NHS Whittington Trust and the, the second uh, project has been commissioned by NHS London uh, and I think uh, I'm the one member of the panel so far that has yet to receive a vaccination because uh, too young too under 50 so uh, hopefully uh, too young um, but hopefully uh, the the shortfall from the the India delivery of the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine isn't going to delay me getting uh, my jab because I'm uh, in the next uh, cohort of uh, of people to receive the jab that's great thanks very much um, so we asked the uh, school of uh, the head of the School of Human Science, Dr. Elizabeth O'Para, to answer a few personal questions about COVID and the vaccine, and she made a lovely video. Now, just have a little bit of patience with me. I'm just going to share my screen and show you Elizabeth's responses. Okay, here we go. Hello, my name is Dr. Elizabeth O'Para, and I've been asked to answer uh, a number of questions on COVID-19, the pandemic, and also the vaccine against coronavirus. So the first question concerns whether or not I've lost any loved ones. Well, thankfully, no. I have not lost any close members of my family to COVID-19 or any close friends, but I do have family members who have lost friends that are close to them and it's been quite difficult watching them go through there's periods of grief and and trying to um, support them in any way I can I think that certainly with regards to um, the lockdown um, it's very very important that we stick to the rules we are going through a, a great period a successful rollout so far anyway um, of the vaccine, which is extremely positive and very heartening. And, and because of it, well, there is light at the end of the tunnel. But we mustn't get complacent. It's very, very important that we continue to stay safe and act responsibly. So for me, yes, I observe the lockdown rules. I will wear a face mask when I go out. I wear a face mask in the shops. I observe social distancing. When I return from the shops, I wash my hands thoroughly. Uh, I live with my mother who is 81 years old. And so it's really, really important for me to be safe so that she um, is safe. With regards to the vaccine, well, yes, I've had my first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. I had it uh, last weekend and I'll be getting my next dose in a few months. My mother, received her first dose of the Pfizer vaccine uh, back in January and she's actually going for her second dose uh, next week and my aunt, my mother's sister, has also received her first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So we're very pro um, vaccine in, in the Opara family. For those people that are anxious about the vaccine, that's understandable. I had a little bit of anxiety when I went to receive the vaccine, so it's understandable that you're anxious that you're hesitant and that's all the more reason to make an informed decision speak to family and friends who've received the vaccine speak to healthcare professionals in your local community your gp for example so that you get the answers that you need to make an informed um, decision and that's the same for those people who are skeptical about the pandemic it is real we've lost a huge number of people in the uk and further afield because of the um, pandemic it is a reality. So if you're unsure, talk to the people that know, avoid those online platforms that are all about misinformation and adding a dose of um, doubt to the scientific facts that are available and that are out there. So stay safe and be responsible and take the vaccine. Thank you. Hello, my name Oops. is Dr. Sorry, Elizabeth O'Connor. And I've been we thank you, Liz. That was excellent, but we're probably not going to have it again right now. Now let me try and de-share my um, slides. 
your entire screen application window. Right, sorry, I'm just having a little trouble with this technical thing. Share my slides again. Okay, so we had an excellent presentation from Liz. And um, oh, I've just got Sheila in. So Sheila, I introduced you and we've just had our presentation from Liz. So um, we're going to go ahead now with Steve, Dr. Stephen Hills. Would you like to make your presentation on how vaccines work? Oh, this was going to be actually Dr. White, uh, Professor White at this point. OK, thank you, uh, Una. How do vaccines work? Well, the vaccine is made up of part of the viral protein and it's the part of the viral protein that allows the virus to get inside our cells. So the vaccines are these proteins then, which are viral proteins introduced into our bodies and our body will recognize them as being foreign. And in response to that, our body will generate antibodies. These are proteins uh, which we have circulating in our blood, which help protect us against all sorts of infections. And so these antibody proteins are going to be generated against the viral protein and the major viral protein, which allows the virus to get inside our cells. So that's basically how vaccines work in a nutshell. And we'll talk about the composition of the vaccines later on. There is one other aspect to how vaccines work, and that is the what we call the cellular responses to um, invasion by foreign uh, bodies. Um, that it's not just protein-based responses, not just antibody, but there are T cells, for example, which also help to um, attack cells which have been infected by viruses as well. So that's another arm of the response. So it's an antibody response, but also a cellular response as well. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Stephen Hills. OK, thank you, uh, Professor White. So. Uh, now moving on to, um, now that we know how the vaccines work, we want to know uh, how effectively do they work. So uh, in the news is, is the big headline number of efficacy. And different uh, vaccines have, in, in various studies, have found different efficacy uh, results. So Pfizer, 95%, uh, the, the Russian uh, Sputnik uh, vaccine, 92%, Moderna, 94 and a half. Uh, Oxford AstraZeneca 70% but this it was a bit um, con confusing uh, with the Oxford AstraZeneca because there was a mistake in the clinical trial whereby uh, some participants were given a, a lower initial dose and actually uh, in the study it found that they had a, a there was better efficacy for those individuals that received a lower initial dose rather than the 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 participants who received the standard dose twice, they had an um, efficacy of 62%. And then there's been a second study on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, recently, results have come out for that in the United States, and that's been found to be 79% uh, effective. Sinopharm, uh, the same, 79%. And very confused. Sinovac, which is uh, another uh, Chinese vaccine, there's been four different studies. And the variance in the the efficacy is huge. So one study uh, found 50%. That yeah, 91. So um, this uh, really speaks to the topic of fact or, or fiction, because what is is the number that we um, that we should believe, and uh, and how do we interpret what is meant by efficacy and then just to add where i've um, provided an asterisk this is where the the results have been published in pe a peer review journal and for um people like myself who like to really go in and understand the numbers that's really helpful because you can actually go in and you you can uh, these efficacy rates and that's something that i'm going to be talking about in just a moment so with this headline number so how is it calculated well simply put uh, these are numbers that come from randomized controlled trials where some participants are given the jab and some participants are given a placebo 
And what we, do, what we do is once we've completed that study, we've collected all of our data, we calculate the infection rate. So if we're thinking about how we get to the 71% for the, the for AstraZeneca jab, we calculate that in the, um, of the 5,807 people that actually received the jab, 30 of them became infected. So that gives us an infection rate of 0.5%. But in the uh, control group, placebo, the infection rate was 101 out of 5,829 participants, so 1.7%. Then what we do is we take the infection rate in, in the participants divided by the infection rate in the control group, so we divide that 0.5%, and that gives us 0.294. So that's not quite the, the efficacy rate. What we actually need to do is then we just minus um, that from one times it by 100 and that tells us that when we compare the infection rates between those who got the vaccine and those who didn't that the vaccine was 71 percent more effective than not having the vaccine than receiving the the placebo so very simply put we're just comparing infection rates and those who receive the placebo in the control group so one of the questions that we that we were asked was, uh, are all treasure, are all trials measuring the same outcomes? Well, they're all measuring efficacy in the same way, so they all have to do the same calculation that I've just gone through, but they're not always looking at the same outcomes. So when we're talking about um, infection, that could be whether or not somebody tested positive, or whether or not somebody um, identical. Um, the follow-up determined that an individual had uh, symptomatic COVID and then was tested. So that might not include people that were asymptomatic. So this is this is problematic. Um, and similarly, some trials looked at hospitalization numbers, and those two things are slightly different. So somebody can be hospitalized but not be deemed to have severe COVID. <clears throat> so this makes it difficult to compare the efficacy rates. It, it makes it difficult to, to actually line the, the vaccines up against. We're dealing with some things uh, slightly, slightly different when we're evaluating them. And the reasons for this is that there's different regulators for different territories and they require different outcomes. They don't all work to, the, to a, a uniform set of measures. So those designing the studies have to adhere to what the, the regulators want. So again, that was one of the questions that was posed to us. Um, and then when we're thinking about, can we trust the results? So I think we can trust the results, but we can, we can, most, we can trust the results more once those results have been published in a peer review journal, because the peer review process is like adding a layer of quality control. And um, what we need to be a little bit cautious about is when the manufacturers via press releases uh, report on the efficacy of hospitalizations, severe COVID and death. So quite often you might um, read the headline, 71% um, efficacy rate, but 100% protection against hospitalization and 100% protection against deaths. Well, at that point, we're all cheering, thinking, great, that means we can be completely confident that once we've had the vaccine, we're not going to go into hospital and we're not going to die. Now, um, just to, to, I think we need to be a little bit cautious about that because the way that the trials are designed, they're not powered and that means statistical power um and this is all to do with uh with sample sizes and um in relation to the the population and the data that comes back on efficacy against against anything else other than infections so the way this works is that we were all sat waiting for the the results of the of the the trials to come back and what we kept hearing from oxford for example was that well now that we're in the summer there's not many infections it's really slowing things down because they had a threshold of that had to be met of number of people in the control group being infected with covid in order to be able to 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 have their study be sufficiently powered so that's why we can be confident in the efficacy rates in these trials but when they talk about
hospitalization, severe COVID or deaths, um, the threshold. Uh, some of the conclusions that are made with regard to 100% um, um, protect hospitalization protection against death until uh, we have more data come in with time. But it's certainly uh, very um, positive what we're hearing so far from, from the trials. Um, just to look at these, um, one of the questions we were asked is which vaccine is, is better? So as somebody that hasn't yet received the jab, which one would would I want to get? And the one that I would really want to get, the, the line um, and the, the box on this table that, that really convinces me that uh, one of the vaccines um, at the moment in terms of the evidence that is available that is the best would be the Moderna jab. Because um, I'm not too worried um, about infection and getting a cold um, or, or a flu or, or symptoms that I'm gonna get over in a, in a few days or um, thinking about this maybe from the perspective of my relatives as, as well, what would I want my my uh, my father uh, to have? I really am worried about the, the severe effects. So the Moderna jab in that study, they said they had 100% uh, protection against severe COVID, and there were 30 cases of that in the control group versus none in the, uh, in the experimental group, the group that received the vaccine. So whilst we can be confident of Moderna's uh, efficacy by cases of uh, infection of, of COVID in, uh, in the control group and only 11 in the, the group that received the vaccinations, that's very confident, um, very strong number, but um, is also very good. Um, they don't have any data, they can't report on their data in terms of efficacy against deaths because there weren't any uh, deaths in their trial. So they can't talk about 100% protection against deaths. And the UK um, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca trial, but there was only one. So that is not sufficient to be able to confidently conclude that the Oxford AstraZeneca jab complete um, is 100% effective uh, against death. But other data that's coming out from, uh, from NHS England on the effectiveness of the vaccines, although not in a clinical trial and a randomized controlled experiment, that is, uh, is, is very convincing. And also with the second that's um, been conducted in the US, that hasn't yet been published in the academic literature. So we can't actually look to see uh, the number of people that had either um, were either hospitalized or severe COVID or that died. Um, we don't know how many of those people, um, occur how many of those cases occurred in the control group to, to, to determine how confident we can be with the, with the protection against hospitalization and death. So um, that's it from me. Um, thank you very much. attention, guys, and I'll pass over to the next. Thank you very much. That was very thorough. Um, Dr. Samira Jorfi, yes, um, would you like to come in at this point? Yes, sure. So there has been a question about um, hesitancy with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Other countries are reluctant to use it. And how can we ensure that it is safe? Um, so there have been some incidents, reported incidents regarding the um, blood clotting due to after vaccination. Um, so far, 37 cases have been reported with uh, AstraZeneca. And um, recently, WHO and European Medicine Agency and uh, MH. Um, RA, which is the uh, Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency in the UK, all released a statement. They went through these uh, cases carefully and uh, they um, like released a statement to confirm that there is no scientific evidence that suggests that there has been any risk of uh, developing blood clotting due to AstraZeneca uh, vaccination. Um, so. Um, just for uh, your information, generally, without any vaccination, one in thousand uh, people develop this uh, blood clotting in adult uh, population 
in the UK. So just without uh, doing the vaccination, there is kind of high incident of uh, blood clotting. And more than um, 20 million of uh, uh, people received um, this uh, AstraZeneca vaccine in the UK and Europe, and only 37 cases have been um, reported. And there is no evidence, again, about this linking this um, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine with this uh, blood clotting. Um, this week, we had a release of um, the latest um, clinical trial, phase three of clinical trial of AstraZeneca that has been done in the US, in um, uh, Peru, and in Chile. 20, uh, sorry, 32, more than 32,000 people took part in this uh, clinical trial. And uh, like this um, um, pre-peer review data uh, showed that um, something like 70, uh, having uh, two doses of this uh, vaccine showed 79% uh, efficacy in terms of preventing any symptomatic COVID-19 disease and 100% efficacy of preventing severe disease and hospitalization. Um, so to be honest, it's just um, the benefit of um, vaccination um, generally is um, much higher than the risk of developing any side effect. And so far, nothing has been uh, proved that link this AstraZeneca vaccine with uh, development of uh, blood uh, clotting. And the main risk is um, kind of posing this vaccination that might result in um, um, blood clotting due to COVID-19 vaccination, third way of um, the pandemic coming, and the risk of more uh, mutation, more uh, variants, new variants that make it harder and harder to tackle um, this um, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jumfrey. And we're going to move on now to um, Professor Inal. Thank you, Una. So the, the next question relates to uh, immunity, which will develop either through infection or through vaccination. And the question is whether this virus can actually be removed from our lives. Uh, I think the likelihood is that the COVID-19 will become endemic. Um, this means that it will become a sort of normal virus, if you like, not that different to the common cold virus eventually. I mean, this has happened with coronaviruses in the past. So there are hu four human coronaviruses, and it's thought that they have had zoonotic origins. Um, so they've come from animals to humans. And um, an example, for example, is uh, we've heard of Spanish flu. That was due to influenza. But in the 1890s, a million people died of Russian flu which is believed to have been a coronavirus. Um, it's coronavirus OC43 now, so it's become endemic. And uh, the thing is, about, in terms of previous um, viruses of this nature, we had the SARS um, in 2002, 2003 in Southeast Asia. And the difference between that infection and the current um, SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19 is that with SARS in 2002, uh, people had symptoms and uh, when they were in a condition where they were spreading the virus, it was very obvious that they were ill, so they could be quarantined. And of course, that's not the case with, with COVID-19 and that makes it much harder to control. The question about herd immunity, so the question here is whether herd immunity can build up resistance to different strains. This is something that um, scientists don't even completely agree about. Um, so I think vaccination is the only way to really get to grips with this infection. And uh, although it's a different type of virus, you know, vaccine, the global vaccination campaign worked well for smallpox in the 1970s. And apart from some small pockets in Southeast Asia, uh, polio as well has been uh, largely controlled. Um, I think what will will be needed because of the variants that we've all heard about, so the mutations that this virus uh, can, can acquire, means that we will require booster vaccines to cater for these new variants as and when they arise. And then there's this question of selection pressure on the virus. So um, there's two types of selection pressure really. Um, so this can derive from people who are have perhaps a, their immune system is not working so well 
and then the virus has plenty of time in which to evolve and in effect find a weakness in the host's immune system but then this can also happen at the population level so as more and more people start to get immune the virus can find new ways and, and acquire several mutations in a go to try and get the upper hand The next question was about the long-term effects of the vaccine, and that's sort of at the end of this slide, really. Um, so if I probably start with that, actually, the, because that is the, the question, the long-term effects of the vaccine are, and of course, we don't know because uh, vaccination in, in the UK and in the US as well only started in December 2020. So we can't really say much about the long-term effects. Um, my personal perspective on this is that uh, people might be concerned about longer term diseases uh, that may arise from vaccination such as autoimmune diseases and uh, from my own experience having worked in vaccine development and this is using technology of between 20 to 30 years ago is that when you have a vaccine candidate molecule you have a, a new protein that you want to in effect raise antibodies against a protein from some infectious agent that you want to target that um, one of the first things you do is check to see whether there is any similar proteins in the human being of course that was much harder 20 to 30 years ago but now we have the human genome and we can immediately see uh, possibilities of cross reaction there and so I think this is very unlikely with the current uh, new vaccines that we have that are all targeting the spike protein that we've heard of from the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. In terms of short-term effects, I think that is much more clear. And uh, I've had the vaccine, I've had the AstraZeneca vaccine. Frankly, I would have been happy to have any vaccine, I must say. And the mild side effects, uh, which are listed here, I just simply had a sore shoulder where the injection at the injection site. Um, other than that, people describe um, swelling at the injection site tiredness although that's more likely with a second dose sort of more general body pains are more likely with the second dose so with the first dose um perhaps a mild fever um and as for serious side effects that is something that is monitored for the first 15 minutes after the vaccination and that's the anaphylaxis reactions which really are uh, I believe, I think somebody's going to address this question better later on, but it can be against components of the vaccine, such as polyethylene glycol, that's in the mRNA vaccines. Um, this is found in other medicines, actually, so it's not that uncommon. And as for the AstraZeneca vaccine, there's a similar reagent called polysorbate 80. Um, and that's also actually found in the flu jab, which is, of course, given to the over 65s. Uh, so that is uh, catered for and people look out for that. Lovely. And Thank you, Professor Anel. Uh, and now Dr. Jorfi. Yes. Um, so the question is, can you mix the two vaccines? Um, currently, the advice from WHO, from MHRA, from Europe, um, EMA, European Medicine uh, Agency, um, is that we should uh, have um, the same vaccine twice because the clinical trial has been done like this. Uh, but um, in theory, it shouldn't be harmful, but we don't have any data to have like mixed jabs for the vaccination. Um, and um, recently, a UK trial being um, launched with um, a 7 million budget to see if we can give, like, mix different types of vaccine, give it to people and check for the immunity. Uh, and the, the results are expected to be uh, in summer. And um, this question, uh, people of color are offered the same things as uh, Caucasians, is that okay? Um, yes, it is okay because um, there is no scientific evidence to suggest that um, the vaccine might work differently in people that come from different ethnic minorities. And um, 
lots of clinical trials had uh, participants from um, different um, uh, ethnic minorities. Uh, for example, the latest data that came from um, AstraZeneca, um, the trial was done in um, America. Uh, black people, um, Asian people were um, involved, Hispanic, and also we had data from South Africa, Brazil in the previous trials for uh, different types of vaccine as well. So there is no evidence that um, it shouldn't be done in uh, people who come from um, ethnic minorities. And um, the vaccination is beneficial for all individuals if, um, if we don't consider any race or ethnic minorities. And um, more than 25 million people have been vaccinated in the UK. Um, and and it, the, the result has been uh, amazing in terms of controlling the infection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor White. Okay, yes, I've been asked to, to talk about uh, COVID variants. Can we accurately predict the nature of future variants and hence the possibility of designing uh, or developing tailored vaccines almost ahead of the curve? And I've just simply written probably not. And uh, the analogy is with what we do with the flu vaccine. Every year there's a new flu vaccine offered on the NHS for the over 65s. But that vaccine has been developed in the knowledge of what new strains of flu have evolved in other parts of the world. So we're talking about a vaccine that's given in the UK, but that's a continual monitoring of outbreaks of new strains of flu uh, throughout the world. And on the basis of that, then the new vaccine is uh, developed. So I think the same with COVID, we can't predict how the mutations will, will, will work out. I mean, Professor Anal uh, uh, described a little bit how it happens, but we can't say what the outcome is going to be in terms of the actual structure of the virus. So probably not for that one. Uh, the next question, is this virus a production of human? That means it's produced in a lab as a kind of biological weapon. Well, the origin of the virus is from Wuhan, and that has been the, uh, the origin of the virus has been investigated by the World Health Organization when they were allowed to visit there uh, earlier on uh, last year. And uh, they conclude it's likely to have originated in bats living in the Wuhan region of China. And this is quite credible because it's not unusual for viruses to jump species. I, I believe uh, Professor Nar referred to zoonosis, which is a technical way of saying that a virus living on one type of animal can jump and start living on another type of animal, uh, provided it's, it's got the right mutations to allow it to do so. And this happened, for example, with HIV, which is actually originally a monkey virus and was actually transferred to humans when humans started eating monkeys as bushmeat in Africa all those years ago. That probably happened about 100 years ago. So it's not unusual then for viruses then to uh, jump species. The question is what the bats probably weren't the origin of the virus. The, the, the virus actually jumped to a, another animal, which was then jumped to humans, probably via what were called what are called the wet markets, the animal markets in Wuhan, uh, where there's obviously a, a lot of interaction between humans and all sorts of types of animals. So the origin then, I think, uh, the evidence is that it comes from bats originally. And finally, will it ever end or is it the new normal? Again, Professor Anal has really uh, answered this question uh, that there, there probably will be continual outbreaks of new strains. And so this suggests a scenario similar to the situation to flu that we may need regular uh, boosters or new uh, uh, vaccinations. And I guess on a much larger scale than is carried out for flu at the moment, I'd probably not just for the over 65s, but for, for many other people as well. So. Um, it's going to be interesting to see that how that's going to be carried out on a, on a national scale. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, my short section is referring to vaccine ingredients. Um, the COVID-19 vaccines do not contain live cells such as chimpanzee cells or any fetal tissue or animal products or eggs. Both the Pfizer and the um, AstraZeneca vaccine are suitable for vegans and vegetarians. Um, the recommendation is that you, if you've had an allergic reaction to other types of vaccines, it's recommended that you don't have the Pfizer vaccine. 
And my mum um, ha had has an EpiPen, and she was recommended to have the Oxford for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. People with a history of severe allergic conditions not related to vaccines, like food or pets or this. Uh, venom from snakes or something from the environment or latex should get vaccinated with Pfizer that will be fine people with a history of allergies to oral meds or family history of severe allergic reactions may also get vaccinated with the Pfizer one um, and if you look up the website to see what's in the Pfizer vaccine it's actually the polyethylene glycol which is the source of of the problems with the allergic reaction and that is a preservative there to preserve the RNA in that particular vaccine. It's a stabiliser and it's an that's it, that's the problem. Um, at the end of this session there are uh, there's a slide of resources where you can go and investigate um, more fully the exact ingredients of, of the vaccines. I'm now going to pass on to um, Professor Inal and Dr. Jorfi again to talk about safety measures. And somebody has mentioned this in the chat box. Um, Shall we just do half and half, Samira? Yes, sure. Okay. So, yes, somebody asked this question in the chat as well about the safety considerations in terms of developing this vaccine so quickly. So firstly, I would like to say that the development of vaccines is, is almost more rigorous in terms of safety compared to other medicines. I would say that um, the admirable development over the course of a year has been partly due to the great collaborative spirit between scientists. For example, the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 was uh, before the virus had actually got out of China. We already had the sequence and the design of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine had begun and a lot of money has clearly been pumped into the process. I would say also that in terms of the clinical trials, uh, many clinical trials were virtually stopped, halted during uh, last year because we didn't know what effect the infection may have on those particular trials and then they were fast tracked. So um, there are th three clinical trials, phase one, two and three and for example phase two would be started before phase one had actually ended uh, and the other thing is that the production of the vaccines uh, began before the uh, actually the vaccines were developed fully so um, and the approval had been obtained we, uh, companies were already producing large quantities of of vaccine um, yes Samira, That's like brilliant, Professor Now I'm just going. We've got. We've only got eight minutes or seven minutes left, and we've got discussions about um, approaches, to, uh, people being scared of vaccines, and also uh, uh, nutrition. So, if if you could summarise very briefly the next slide um, oh. about the gap between jab, yeah. the period between jabs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, the in terms of the development of these vaccines there was only one time period that could be tested for uh, for to develop this quickly and uh, a shorter gap between the first and the booster jabs was was actually tested but th that, that does not mean to say that other time periods would be more effective and in fact the most recent data um, get focusing on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine suggests that a longer time period between 10 to 12 weeks uh, is actually optimal that's absolutely fantastic. Could I um, have um, Dr. Baker to come in at this point now? Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm just talking about um, injections here because um, quite often when people are looking at having um, an injection or something they haven't had before, what they do is it may be that actually it's the fear of doing the injection is the biggest issue, but people then look for evidence to support not having the vaccine. So these misconceptions and information are all knowledge based. Well, this is really about your beliefs. Um, what we tend to find in the literature is um, around 10% of people report having a fear of injections. Um, the level for needle phobia is a lot lower than that, um, but quite often the research is that actually it's a fear of the unknown. Um, oh, picture is not showing. Is that me or you? <laughs> oh, I, was, I had a lovely picture for you all to look at um, oh. needles throughout the history. And I found a great picture, but for some reason, although it's on the tablet, it's not showing. <laughs> 
So um, what we what we generally say, um, I mean, if you look at something such as a vaccination, it's very unusual in the population that you will have never had an injection before. But there's some quite useful tips in terms of if you're going from vaccination and you think you're going to be scared of the injection. Um, the most important thing is just let the health professional know they're well trained, they've been given. Well, actually, by now they're giving millions of injections rather than thousands of injections. And one of the things I would say, and actually this is a tip from my own experience, um, um, I don't know if it's fortunate, but I've had the, the, the fortune of having over 55,000 injections so far in my life. Um, if I go for a vaccination, I don't look at somebody giving me the vaccination. Why would you want to do that? So you tend to look the other way. Um, and in terms of the time it takes, it would take 10 to 15 second, seconds for you to get the vaccination for them drawing up and administering it. So um, what we would generally say is if you've got any kind of fear of injections, is just kind of thinking on how you can overcome that and just talk to people about that. So I think I'm going to pass over to Dee next. I Thank you very much, Dr. Bacter. Um, I'm aware of the time and so I'll, I'll be quick with mine. And so the questions that were raised with, with nutrition, uh, and I've been asked this many times and I've seen it on um, social media as well. I have a healthy diet and I believe I have a strong immune system which can fight off COVID-19. So why do I need a vaccine? Well, there's been a lot of research done on um, in the immune system and the diet, in particular, nutrients have been investigated like zinc, selenium, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, but overall, I would summarise, there is no evidence that this alone can fight off a, a, an infection like COVID-19, and especially if you are in the high-risk category. And the second question was specifically about vitamin D. And can this actually prevent you getting COVID-19? And the short answer to that is no, it's not going to help you um, not get the COVID-19. But there is some evidence that people who have low vitamin D status are more likely to suffer the severe symptoms and become hospitalized. And vitamin D also is one of those is one of the few nutrients which cannot be met by diet alone and, um, and is, one, is the only uh, one that's recommended by the government for population supplementation. So I would recommend taking supplements and I don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to plug that we are actually going to be launching a health, a health promotion study on vitamin D very soon, um, aimed at the London Met community and providing vitamin D supplements as well. That's absolutely smashing. Thank you very much. And last but not least, um, Professor Yuff is going to talk about infection control. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I don't know why my video won't share at the moment. Um, I, just to say that um, with all types of respiratory infections, which COVID is one of them, the um, traditional um, cover your cough, cover your sneeze, use a, a, a tissue, throw it away and um, wash your hands afterwards has been around for lots and lots of years. And you can see that during the COVID crisis, we adapted that um, and highlighted how important it was to clean your hands um, and after you've um, coughed and sneezed and they tell you to sneeze into your um, the crook of your elbow rather than into your hands because otherwise you put the virus onto your hands and then you move it straight forward and you touch other things and the virus can stay viable on other surfaces for periods of times so you obviously don't want to do that there um we've been uh, i've been we were asked also um about whether we should be shaking hands um today actually on the telly it was quite funny that um we were talking uh, they were talking about um, shaking hands and um it for now it means that you're too close because they're recommending we stay at least a meter apart two meters ideally um and for a while i think that people will be doing more fist pumps elbow touching toe bumps and other versions there for the near future but they've shown historically people go back to handshaking we like 
to touch each other it's sort of like a sense of community um another question we were asked about was in ventilation and ventilation indoors so we say that ideally um you can see in the picture here that by opening a window and having a good flow through of air, it reduces the number of particles that are close to you and close to somebody else. So transmission from person to person is reduced that way. So that's why in the classrooms at the moment, they've got their windows open and they're encouraging people to put cardigans on, jackets on to keep clear there. But a flow through of air is really good for us. Um, so I'm trying to go through this quite quickly there. Should wearing gloves be compulsory? The bottom line to that is no. It makes us quite lazy at washing our hands. And quite often, um, if you, it, it, this is gloves in, in the public po domain when you're out and about. Um, people touch their faces. And they, so the virus is on the glove. They touch their face. And that was one of the easiest ways of us self-infecting um, there. And it makes people think they don't need to wash their hands. People don't know how to put on gloves and take them off properly, so they often reinfect themselves that way. Um, we were also asked about the pros and cons of wearing masks. Now, initially, the government chose to not encourage us to wear masks. I don't think they wanted a rush on the type of PPE that was needed for um, hospitals and um, care home type situations. But um, fabric, masks that are either two or three layers thick are really good tight woven cotton is really good for domestic purposes and um, we're going to be doing some research work on um, looking at another type of material and seeing how effective that is so we're looking forward to London Met being able to help the local population in care homes and maybe the hospitals that you re have a reusable washable type of product that will save on reducing plastics so i've rushed through that really fast but if anybody wants to put questions in the boxes i will answer them and i'll hand you back to una now that was absolutely smashing thank you very much so very briefly um the, the final part of our presentation is that um really to refute some of the scare stories. So there's no evidence that vaccines will affect fertility and there's no reason why they should affect fertility. Um, there's no known risk associated with COVID vaccination for pregnant women, but currently um, in, in order to be cautious, not very many pregnant women have been vaccinated. Those who have been vaccinated in the United States have been absolutely fine. In this country, pregnant women are advised that um, they should only have the vaccine if they have a very high risk for other for ex as exposure or the health problems. The microchips thing um, is uh, is unfounded, although it probably comes from an interview with Bill Gates where he was talking about digital certificates and it seems to have arisen from that. So unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but we are going to run this session again. There, here are some resources. Um, that that you can use and this session will be recorded and it will be available to people to have and we've got other events in this series we're going to repeat this session as an evening session and um, we can I think we'll extend it to an hour and a half to give more time for questions um, and then we're also going to do one specifically on masks and social distancing and specifically on the virus so uh, my heartfelt thanks goes to our audience for coming along to listen to us and my wonderful team who've given their expertise and, the, and their time to do this. So thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to have to close the session because we have gone, in fact, four minutes over time. But um, it's been a pleasure to have you all. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Mm -hmm.